Good morning, and thank you for joining us for our midweek devotion from Unity Baptist Church in Champaign, Illinois. We're in Acts chapter 17, and we've been talking about Paul's message. One of the great messages uh, that are recorded in the scriptures, uh, Old or New Testament, is the message that Paul brings on the uh, Areopagus, better known to us as Mars Hill, in Athens. Paul was not a man to uh, dawdle, uh, you know, just kind of uh, hang around uh, while he's waiting for his friends to get back from Thessalonica. Uh, he is uh, in Athens and tours the city. It's not a very big city at that time. Right now it's about four and a half million. But at that time, uh, it's about 20,000 people. But it was a religious center. And so Paul is touring the city, and as he tours the city, uh, he gets upset. Uh, the Bible says <clears throat> that he was stirred. And, you know, I think that's an important word. I mean, you, you look at, at this man who, who has other objectives in, in his life. He hadn't, apparently hadn't, uh, uh, planned to stay in Athens. Uh, it was just kind of a layover, if you will, to put it in modern terminology. And and yet Paul's not one to just stand around. And so he tours this city, this important religious center, and he sees all of the temples and all of the idols and and all of the the worship of these people and the the center of, of philosophy and and all of of these uh, things in the uh, in the country of Greece, and he stirred. It upsets him, and and I think it's important sometimes that we be upset uh, to to look around at at our country or our city or our state. I I don't think it's a sinful thing to be upset if we are upset for for God's cause if we are are stirred to action uh, because of righteousness. And that's, that's where the Apostle Paul is here as, as we open up Acts chapter 17. He is stirred. He is, he is you know, we might say he is disturbed. Uh, he is uh, upset because all of this that he sees is in really ultimately in rebellion against the the God that is. And so he begins to talk. Paul just can't keep his mouth shut about this. And so he begins to go to the synagogue. He goes to <clears throat> where uh, it seems pretty obvious that the Jews haven't been doing their job. They haven't been uh, telling others about the Lord he goes to the marketplace every day and he begins to talk to people, witness to people, share with people about the, the God who loves them and the creator of the world. And while he's there, he runs into the Stoics and the uh, Epicureans, two philosophical uh, uh, groups, and he talks to them about these things. And so he's invited to Mars Hill where the debate goes on uh, over philosophy, and Paul accepts the invitation. <clears throat> what is he going to do? He wants opportunities to share the gospel with people, and so he stands up and and talks to these people, and he be, because they wanted to hear what he had to say, and so he he begins to share with them the truth of the gospel and introduce them to this unknown God that he found an altar to and that they worshiped. And he talks to them uh, about the fact that they are ignorantly worshiping a God they do not know. And it is that God that he wants to introduce them to. And, and the God that he wants to introduce them to is the God of creation, the one who made, <clears throat> who made all of the things that they observe. That's the God he wants them to know. And so he begins to talk to them in verse number 24. Uh, God that made the world and all things therein, 
He's the Lord of heaven and earth. He doesn't dwell in temples made with men's hands. And he says he's not, he's not uh, a God that needs anything from us. He's the one who has given us all things. He's given us our life. He's given us our breath. He's given us everything that we have. And he hath made of one blood, he said. We're all of one blood. We all come from one place. He is the creator God. He is the God who has made us. He has made our nations. He has determined the boundaries. He's made our ethnicity. He has determined our ethnicity. All of these things. But, but what Paul is pointing to is that it all goes back to one place at one time and one God not the multiple gods that the Greeks were worth worshiping. And then in verse number 27, he begins to get into the gospel. And he said that they should seek the Lord. Why has God done all of this? In our Sunday morning services, we are uh, talking about the gospel. We're talking about the book of Romans, we're in chapter two right now, but when we were in chapter one, uh, the Lord talked about how he has revealed himself to us through his creation, through his word. And Paul says that they should seek the Lord. People, every person, wherever they are, whatever their ethnicity, their religious background, or whatever else, Every person has been given by the God who made them, who sustains them, and who loves them. They have been given the opportunity to know him. And Paul says in verse number seven, 27, that they should seek the Lord. Every person, every person has the obligation before God because of what God has done for them because what God has shown them of himself through his creation and through the law of God that is written upon the hearts of men, we call it the conscience. But it is the law of God written upon our hearts. Paul says on the basis of that, they should seek the Lord. If haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. I want you to stop for just a minute, and I want you to think about that with me. The God who loves us, who made us, who sustains us, is not very far from any one of us. God is everywhere. He is omnipresent. And yet we, as human beings in our natural sinful state, cannot f find him. We, we cannot, in our natural minds, in our natural state, we cannot find him. <clears throat> Why? Because of our sin. Isaiah says that it is our sin that is separated between us and our God. And because of that condition of ours, God sent his son. He gave his son for us that we might be brought back to a relationship with him. And besides that, God has given us his creation. He has given us his word to make us aware of him. You know, go to any society throughout the world and there is a, a strong tendency on the part of human beings to seek God. They want to find God. They want to worship him. They know that that's what they're here for. And so in the remotest tribes, they may, it's like the Greeks, it won't be the God of the Bible, but they're going to worship something. They don't know what that God may be. 
And so the Greeks worshiped an unknown God. And Paul said, this is the God that I want to introduce you to. I want to introduce you to the God that made you. And, and Paul says there that you have an obligation to seek the Lord. You have the obligation to seek him. And he has given you the evidence of his presence, of his existence, that you might do that. That you might feel after him and find him. The Lord through Jeremiah said, and you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. You know, there are stories of people in, in the most remote regions of the world who look at the creation, who understand the, the moral law of God written in their hearts. And they say to themselves, have said to themselves, there has got to be a God out there that, that can be known. And they have sought him and they have found him. We've had people come to our own church. They're, they're Americans. They've been around this all of their lives. They know about Jesus to some degree. But they have come seeking. And maybe you're seeking today. And I want you to know that God is not hiding from you. Psalm 19 says that every day the creation shouts out to us and declare the glory of God to us. And, and Paul says that God is not far from every one of us. God is not hiding from you. He wants you to find him. He wants you to know him. And to find him and know him comes through the written word of God and through the preaching of the gospel. Jesus Christ came, gave himself for you, for me, for these Greeks who stand here uh, uh, on the Areopagus with, uh, with the Apostle Paul listening to him. That's why Christ has come, that we might know the Lord more than just to set us a good example. Christ Jesus came to take our place, to be our substitute, to pay the penalty for our sin before a holy God. And I want you to know from the word of God that he wants to be known by you. And he can be. And if you have questions about this, I, I appeal to you to contact us, come to our church, and, and listen to the gospel. Receive Christ as Savior and Lord in repentance of your, of your sin. And when we do that, as God spoke through Jeremiah, he said, you shall seek me and you'll find me when you look for me with all of your heart. I want you to know that the God of creation, the God who loves you, the God who paid the penalty of your sin is hiding in plain sight through his creation and through his word written in our hearts and penned through his word, preached from pulpits, across our land, across the world. And he says to you, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest unto your souls. That is the promise that we are given through the sacrifice, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You can know what may be to you right now, the unknown God. Father, I pray today that you will bless this uh, message, speak to people's hearts, draw them to yourself, gift them with faith, 
bring them to a place of repentance, raise them from death to life, translate them from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of your dear son. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening. Hope you have a good day.